Hello, Emily. Hi. Welcome back to the house. Thanks. How are you? I'm really good. I'm really glad to be doing this. I'm really thrilled you're here. Yeah. It's a full, you've been here before and played in a couple of different incarnations, but this is a full house session. Mm, I love it. That should be fun. Mm. Um, walk me through the process of this this album, and I, I ask you this because the last time we spoke, the last two times, you had a, you had a bunch of stuff. You had written stuff. Or mm. There was things, and we I didn't know what order they were going to come out in. So how did Choir of the Mind start? Yeah, well, and you're so right, because you've been, you know, you know, the progress of metrics since the beginning, and we just kind of always write and always work, and we don't totally know where things are going to end up, um, which has worked out really well for us in the past. For example, you know, with Scott Pilgrim versus The World, right. um, Edgar's film, it was because we had the song Black Sheep that wasn't on fantasies, which just didn't really fit to us, that we had it aside to give to that film. Same things happened with all kinds of other projects. But what happened recently is we found ourselves making this like orchestral cinema album metric thing. And it was like, is it a solo record? What is this? We kind of, after Pagans, had this vision of doing mm -hmm. something. And then we all just felt like this is actually the time for me to do my thing. And right. as is often the case, you know this from creative process, it's sort of like when you look back, it looks mapped out, but it really is the result of just waking up every morning and going to work. We just, Jimmy and I built that studio. We just go yeah. to work, you know. And and you and one of the things you do sometimes is figure out that you're going to make a different record than you thought you were going to make, you know. One of the things I like <laughs> about that so much is that it's certainly the older I get and the more I try to be a part of the creative process is the end result is only a small part of the story. Mm -hmm. It's just getting there is actually the most interesting thing. And, you know, if you think about the difference between when your first solo record came out, who you were to what it is now, totally. the right time would just feel right for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. How new were all the songs? It's a mixture. I kind of carry, throughout my life, I've kind of carried lines and melodies and stuff. It's kind of like I have a, well, a choir. <laughs> Yeah. All the time, um, a lot of several songs came really quickly in the process. Like "Minefield of Memory" was completely from scratch and happened in the moment in that session. Other things had been had been with me a little bit longer. So I, I always kind of every song has bits and pieces of the past. I have stuff from when I was a kid that I wrote that I'm still always trying to get out there. So does the song have a purpose for you? Yeah, I mean, my purpose is that it serves somebody else. Um, so much of my writing, I know, I know it's for me to just process my thoughts and, and stay focused. It's meditative, you know? Yeah. But if I get to the point of releasing something, it's because I think what I discovered and have learned and have written is going to be of value to someone mm -hmm. and serve them. And I've found throughout my life that that's the one thing I know I can do in this world. And I've had enough people come to me and say that I help them. So that's, that's it, the purpose of the song. Songs come through you, right? A lot of artists would suggest that, and a lot of artists suggest that it's just hard work and you, you slug it out. Yeah, I'm kind of more on the ladder of like, yeah. I feel like they come, it's not like from above, it's yeah. sort of like, and I, for me, my instrument being the piano, it's kind of like my altar, you know, I just kind of sit there and grind it out until there's something there, but it doesn't feel like, ah, uh, it feels very like you earn it. If you get something, you fought for it, you know? One might feel the pressure of being there in service of others when you know that people come to you and say your songs do this for me or do this for me, when you sit down to write a record this far into your career, mm -hmm. that can't help but be part of your, your, your brain. I guess, right? Yeah. I feel like it's more though that it's so intrinsically my life's job to like, right. I feel to go to the darkest place that I have for myself and muck about in there, make sense of it, and bring it to light, knowing that there's that universality with other people. So it's not really that I feel the pressure, I just feel like, it's a very strange thing, especially post-internet, because this is what music and art and culture has been about forever, without us literally having a web, right. you know? But I do feel a psychic sense of just like, that when I find something and I'm really honest with myself and I craft it, into clarity that I'm connected with other people, but I don't feel like I owe it to anybody. You I, feel, know? I feel like I know the answer to this question, but I, and I'm assuming you don't have a quiet brain. <laughs> no, right? I mean, it's getting better. I'm like meditating and stuff. When, when did you start <laughs> doing that? Well, I mean, I'm really an amateur. Yeah. Um, like actually around we're making this record, yeah. Does I just feel like enough is enough. Like I, what am I gonna do? It's a racket in there. Well, what's the residual effect of having a noisy brain like that? Well, you can be very productive. Um, I've had a very productive life, um, but I also think it's exhausting, and I think it's. I I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. The things that I have to put up with, hearing myself say. <laughs> so I don't know where that comes from. If I'm like you know, 
channeling society at large, or right. if it's whatever it is. I, I was, you know, we were talking about this earlier. I had a great childhood. I had a great, you know, but there's just this like constant, like, nah, nope, not you, not you. So, um, I mean, that is exhausting sometimes. It is, and I don't know that that's that valuable. I think the the beauty of writing and of performing is it's just the concentration and the piece to just sort of lift away. Like I hope with choir, like I wanted it to be not more something else to consume. I kind of wanted it to be just a breath, like stop consuming for a minute. I don't know. It's I know it's still in the same medium, but no, maybe but you can certainly do things differently. Yeah. Are you trying to quiet voices? I'm kind of trying to out them. I'm trying to shine the light right. and then see if maybe I could have the next decade of my life not be like riddled by that, you know? The riddle of memory was it? Is, what's it called? Is it called the riddle? Mind field of memory. Mind field yeah. of memory. No, but isn't there like a TED talk that had some sort of oh the riddle? Was, yeah, did we talk about this the last time? No, the, we haven't. No. Oh, I I love that, and I actually was really influenced by that while I was making this record. That's amazing that you're mentioning memories that memories and experiences. Yeah, right? the remembering self and the experiencing self. Um, and that's such an interesting reference because it's they he, he talks about the scientist talking about the way we remember things yeah. that gives the example of an incredible performance of an orchestra that was transcendent and everyone had the most amazing time and then at the end there's a bad note yeah. and everyone says it ruined the whole performance hey. but it didn't because the experiencing self has that experience it's only the remembering self that's damaged but but the the role the remembering self has mm. in whether or not you think you had a great life or a vital life. It's, it's this is the thing. We if give it a lot of power. That's it. And you're and we're all narrating to a degree, right? Like whatever whatever you're telling yourself. Maybe there's somebody who's just like, I gotta stop telling myself I'm so great. You know, maybe yeah. there are people struggling with that. But uh, you, it's something to think about. Of what's the story you're telling yourself of your life, and is it making you the best you can be, or is it just is it crippling you? Where are you on that spectrum? Um, I think I'm. I think it was. And then think I'm between this and the next metric record that we're already deeply into the the writing and the and the spirit around everything. I feel like maybe I have another blossoming to come throughout my life. That's what it's been like. Just right. the worst stage fright, the worst fear, and just like you know, it's crippled a- with anxiety. But that's what rock and roll is for: is to like once you once you jump off the stage, you never really jump back on. You know. There's this funny thing where <laughs> most people who are really good at this end up being embraced by the people they were running from in the first place. Totally, yeah. It's like, yeah, the football players yeah. finally understand the, the theater kids. Yeah. I, I, go to, I go to a metric show or an Emily Haynes show, and it's like, oh, yeah, there's these dudes that heard the song on the radio, and they're like, you know, they're art school students, right? Like, it's just <laughs> totally. a stream. Yeah, yeah. Was it an adjustment for you as you, as you gained popularity? Uh, yeah, because it was never... I just sort of assumed that we would... I didn't... Yeah, I thought we would... I knew we would do this for our lives, me and Jimmy. Like, we're in it for life. Yeah. But I didn't ever know that it would make sense to so many people. And I love that. And now I actually feel like that is that is the point, is universality. It's not like purposefully being obtuse or niche and like tribal and snobby. I think the best songs in the world are just like, everybody feels that, you know? Do you have a lot of, do you have a lot of close people around you that, you that you listen to and trust? Is your, do you have a big circle or a small circle? Um, in terms of like advice and stuff? Yeah. I and, have, and guidance. Yeah. It's... it's it's a pretty, it's a medium-sized circle. You probably know everyone in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I do know, but I don't know the roles in your life. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. yeah no, I, I have mean, loyal, Jimmy, of course. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, and I look at my life and what I, in terms of narration and, like, yeah. the story I tell myself that I know is true is that I'm a really good friend and I have really good friends. And no matter how this all plays out, that has ended up being the story, actually. And, you know, Kev talked about this with The Broken Record and, yeah. you know, me and Jimmy and Josh and Jules. It's just, I seeing those guys... And going in again on another record, you know, last tour we sold more tickets than ever. We're just going, and I lo- I met these guys in Brooklyn like a right. million years ago, and that's the that is the purpose of my life. So you, know? you mentioned Kev too. This is the year where you think about. There's the Stars record. There's the BSS record. There's the tour. There's this stuff that you're in the, the throes of a metric record. There's all this, you know, Amy as a genius. All this stuff floating around this crew, this year and yeah. last year. And you think back to when it started. Mm-hmm. Could one have imagined that this is where we would be? I know. It's weird. I mean, in a way, it feels like, what? how could it possibly have been anything else? Yeah. But I guess, especially for me, I left a lot. I've been gone a lot. I've been always nomadic. And I, wasn't, I didn't know how tied my heart was to this place. Mm-hmm. Um, and coming back here and making the record here really reaffirmed that. It's like a really soft anchor. 
It's nice to have that. <laughs> it is. It was interesting watching the crowd at the at the you know Fort York this summer mm-hmm. when the vocals started for anthems, and watching you and watching the band and watching the reaction, and I was wondering, what are you thinking up there? I had a panic attack after that. Did you? Yep. How come? Um, I mean, who knows why they come? But well, I I yeah because we had played it in Manchester. Um, and the meaning of the lyrics had taken on this whole other dimension that was just too much, too strange to have be like, now you're all gone, got your makeup on and you're not coming back. Be like like the most literal and horrible and horrifying thing. Right. And then I was back with all my friends and the layers of time, the minefield of memory, it was, it was actually like all my friends and their children and all the people and everything. It was like too much for my body to like hold I haven't actually told anybody that but that's uh, interesting Amy sorted me out really yeah I've never <laughs> I've never had that though on stage like I've had nerves to kill you but never actually been taken away like that so that song is now belongs to so many people and is such a it's a different thing it's a different thing and yeah playing in Manchester now that song is no, never going to be yours again mm and luckily, Johnny Marr was there, so we could just, that's, he centered the whole thing. I mean, aside from the seriousness of the situation, mm-hmm. I mean, what a throwaway line. Johnny Marr. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Marr was there. Yeah. He's that kind of person, though, too, yeah. and that's in my experience, too, of like, well, you know this from interviewing yeah. people. The really successful people, there's nothing, there is no extra yeah. layer of, yeah. of anything, and it's a, good, it's a good marker and monitor of, like, who you're dealing with. Yeah. Anybody who throws that sort of, like, you know, a, a, like attitude, for lack of a better word, of being on some other plane of existence than the rest of humanity. Right. First sign that they haven't done much, in my opinion. You know, because <laughs> the great even Lou, like he's he's for all his crustiness, he was like right there. You know, he was never pretending to be anything but right there. Kevin Hearn told me a lot about, about being around Lou. Yeah. And what it is there any of the Lou residue on this record? Like, because well, he, when I'm hearing some of the vocals and hearing how you're doing it, I wonder if it's there. I mean, he's a permanent influence, and then the personal part is, I mean, if anything, it's that he listened, he, he listened to Knives, and he was listening to it at the end of his life. Um, so it probably it's just more of a subconscious, like, try to uphold some standard. I have no idea what he saw in me or in the music, but I guess to just keep doing it. The greatest gift I suppose you can give somebody is to be there for them when they need it the most, and if you can't always be there in person, let them still be have a part of you. And maybe that's what that is for him. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Thanks for taking I the like time. I like that. Thanks. I, that's I like good. I feel like I got some therapy out of it, too. Yes. Like, I'm here to help. My secret right. mission. <laughs> Not All so right. secret. It's showtime. Yeah. <laughs>